Of course, there's always a chance one would show up somewhere. But the demand for that edition is far greater than the demand for the uncoded edition. Therefore, having seen this type of thing happen again and again, we begin to wonder if there is not some meaning that we should look for where this coding appears or where this monument is raised upon the title of a book. In this case, I think we are entitled to look for something, and I do not think that we don't have to look very far to find it. One interesting point occurs in the preface of the reader that is signed by Dr. Rawley, who was again Lord Bacon's chaplain and secretary. It gives us just a little clue to the new Atlantis. It must be remembered now that apparently the new Atlantis is a fictional work, also dealing with one of these mysterious utopias. This one apparently located somewhere mid-Pacific, halfway between the western of Asia. But in any event, Rowley writes, This fable my Lord devised to the end that it might exhibit therein a model or description of a college instituted for the interpreting of nature and the production of great and marvelous works for the benefits of men under the name of Solomon's House or College of the Six Days Work. And even so far, his lordship has proceeded to finish that part. Certainly, the model is more vast and high that can possibly be imitated in all things. Notwithstanding, most things therein are within man's power to effect. His lordship thought, also in this present fable, to have composed a frame of laws or of the best states or mode of a commonwealth. But foreseeing it would be a long work, his desire to the collecting of natural history diverted him, and he preferred many degrees before it. This opens a very interesting point because we know that it was upon the model of this new Atlantis College that the Royal Society of England was later founded. And Thomas Pratt, in his history of royal society, definitely declares that the inspiration of it was derived from Bacon's College of the Six Days' Work. We also know that Isaac Newton and many other important men of his time, scientists, architects, leaders of thought, belong to a group called the Society of the Unknown Philosophers. This has likewise been traced, and we find it arose among the same group that later integrated the Royal Society. Thus, out of the College of the Six Days' Work, an actual physical institution did ultimately spring. But this institution was only a fragment of the original invention. It was evidence from his preface of Dr. Rawley, that Lord Bacon had in mind creating the archetype or pattern of a great system of education, and that therefore it was not to be regarded merely as a fable, not even as a utopia in the popular sense of that time. It was not a story of men seeking for a better world. It had to do with something which in the development of the account we are impelled to assume already that an existence and that like several of these other utopias these distant places hidden from men imply perhaps a secret society or a secret association of persons that actually did exist as in the case of the guilds where the concept of a social commonwealth 
existed long before it burst through to become a political equation in European history. In any event, this is the idea of the great college or school that was to be built. The next, perhaps, I think is more dramatic than any of the others because it reveals an extraordinary knowledge which Lord Bacon possessed. It causes his mariners to start out from the coast of Peru, which is a peculiar place for them to start. They sailed from Peru in a westerly direction and after a time met with adverse winds and were unable to proceed on their journey. They then were favored by winds from the south that drove them northwards and in what locality we are assumed to suppose that the discovery of this mysterious island of the wise men took place. We have no way of actually estimating various opinion has been advanced on these also. Perhaps these supposed areas were somewhat near to what we now know as the Hawaiian Highlands. Perhaps what was really replied was some of the primitive culture of the South Pacific. In any event, several points are of interest, particularly to Americaners who have been working in this area. The principle in this thinking is based upon certain words used by Lord Bacon, which in his time were meaningless or entirely beyond the general comprehension of the day. Some of the points that he makes in here were not finally clarified until the 20th century. Yet he seems to have had some basic knowledge about these older places. For example, in one place in the New Atlantis, we have this sentence. Yet so much is true that the said country of Atlantis, as well as that of Peru, then called Cuya, as that of Mexico, then named Tarambo, were mighty or proud kingdoms in harm's shipping and riches. This is more than just a guess. In some way, Lord Bacon was in possession of certain facts. Kuya was the name for an ancient level of classical and cultural attainment, almost prehistoric Peru. This was not known in England or anywhere else at the time of Lord Bacon, but it is quite possible that this particular group of Kuya symbolizing a prehistoric Peruvian culture fits into some of our modern archaeological needs in our own present day's effort to trace the antiquity of Peruvian culture. For here was one of the great centers of ancient Western culture. Poindexter Miles, in his study of Inca, has also noted that in the description of one of the great passage of Solomon's house, it is described by Bacon that he wore a turban-like hat in which was placed a stalk of wheat. This stalk of wheat occurs in ancient Indian pictures of the Incas, and the great leaders of the Peruvian culture used the stalk of wheat as a scepter. We do not know how Lord Bacon might have known this. It is possible that some of these records were brought back, but it seems to be working from something more than just fabled interest in the situation. There is some possibility, although we have never been able to pin down the fact with certainty that Lord Bacon was with Sir Francis Drake on one of his voyages to the Western world. It is also possible that Lord Bacon, because of his extraordinary connections, was able to do something that no other European before him had attempted to do and no one since his time has thought of doing.